Or am I wrong? I'm wrong, aren't I? Because that would double Pac-Man, wouldn't it? Yeah, so I can't quite do that yet. But what did we, uh, what did we have over there? One half, the, see that? What is this? Now, Lee may have a more, a more uh, clever calculation in the book. I'm just going off what I've learned a long time ago, okay? Yeah, this is just twice dxi, dxj, right? Juxtaposition here, we don't do the circle dot thing. All right, so uh, um, yeah. So we have what? We've got uh, sum over i less than j of 2 gij dxi dxj plus the sum over i of GII, um, and what is, what is, by the way, um, <laughs> what if you look at alpha alpha, what happens? It's not zero. It's not zero, no. So that is dxi dxi, right? And I'm out of board space, but I believe if you think about the calculations I've done here, you could rewrite this as just the sum over i and j of gij dxi dxj. Notice that this is the unrestricted sum. It's not the sum i less than j. It's i greater than j and i less than j again. But anyway, I, you know, Lee's probably got a more clever and less stupid way of calculating this in the book. I should probably look at his. Um, I mean, he's got, he's got it in four lines here. <laughs> uh, hmm. But he's also used the symmetry of GIJ as GJI and uh, switching, switching indices. Hmm. Well, anyway, there it is. So that's what makes this such a nice convention to my mind is that it reproduces. These are the kinds of formulas that you'd read in like you know, 19th century calculus books. They're trying to talk about the distance function, the metric, um, something like for example, hey, an example, well, you know, um, you know, you might have something, we typically you see this notation, ds squared is dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. You know, well, you could look at this as being g is dx dx plus dy dy plus dz dz, right? This is the Euclidean metric on R3. When you actually put that into practice, how does it work? Right? What happens when you feed that G, you know, V and W? What do you get? You get, you know, well, you get V dot W, right? <laughs> and that's what you get. And the matrix of the Euclidean metric is just the identity matrix. Right here. 
gij um, is just equal to the crown or delta ij if we're using the usual Cartesian coordinate system and all. So I, I just, I'm, I think it's really cool, like his choice of notation, because it, it, it nicely comports with like classical formulas. that you might see me write in other courses. Um, all right. Now another thing we can do is we can talk about the, yeah, example two. Suppose you have mg and M tilde, G tilde, all right? Both Ramanian manifolds. So the, uh, it's interesting, like the, you know, Riemann, well, he spoke in German, of course, and he, he didn't use the word manifold. That's not, you know, it's <laughs> not a German word, is it? Um, as you guys have noticed, it's in the King James. Right, I mean, it's an old English word. And um, so the word that Riemann used for manifolds has been translated in two different ways in different parts of math. Um, obviously, it's been translated manifolds. We've been talking about that. But the other way it's been translated is variety. So a variety is basically, uh, roughly speaking, it's a solution set to some set of polynomial equations. It's probably more than that at this point, but it's roughly that. Kind of like a manifold is roughly a set that's parameterized by some, you know, par parametric, parametric rules, right? Well, that's not kind of how we look at it. We look at more of like from the chart, which is the opposite perspective, but every chart can be turned into a parameterization if you invert it. And they are invertible, so we could always talk about all of differential geometry in terms of parameterizations if we did so choose. We just prefer to we like to look at it from the chart perspective because it kind of uh, helps us to get in the framework of the manifold to try to understand, you know, what the what the calculus looks like on the mani from the manifold's perspective, um, as opposed to always thinking about everything in terms of um, the parameter space, let's say. But anyway, it's interesting though. Like those, so varieties are studied in like algebraic geometry. Whereas manifold theory is a quite different thing. But to start with, it was both of the ideas were together because you could either describe abstract spaces as like a solution set of some system of equations or as like a parameterized set, you know? And these are two different ways of describing something uh, in an abstract way. Okay, anyway, so if we have two Riemannian manifolds, uh, then we can define the so-called product metric Um, G hat, which is the external direct sum of G and G tilde on the uh, product manifold. We talked about how to construct the product manifold from manifolds early on, right? You just kind of like pair their charts and it gets you a chart on the pair uh, on the Cartesian product. And um, so, like, if we had, you know, if we had chart X on M, and if we had chart Y on M tilde, then we could look at um, G. That like I'm already. I'll, right, I'll, I'll use this notation. It's a good. It's a good notation is any. The matrix G I J, right? You could look at it, have a block, di block diagonal decomposition. You would have the matrix of M in the upper block and the matrix of um, M tilde in the lower block. And that, that, that would be it. So, of course, this, um, you know, if you think about, you can think about R3. Or think about, you can think about R4 in this way, for example. You can think about R4 
as the product of the plane and the plane. And so the plane has the Euclidean metric, the other plane has the Euclidean metric. When you put them together, you get R4. And the metric on R4, the product metric, it's just the identity, the identity, which gives you the four by four identity, which of course is the matrix of just the plain old four dimensional dot product. So you can kind of understand bootstrapping Euclidean space from one dimension to a higher dimension using this idea as one thing he points out, which is nice, um, there's that. Now, these things I've been telling you are just kind of fun. Um, the next result he proves, um, I, I don't, as usual, I'm too lazy to prove his difficult theorems, so you'll forgive me, but um, proposition 13.3 is a wee bit technical. I guess I can fit it up here. Uh, proposition 13.3 it says that every smooth manifold with or without boundary admits a Ramanian metric So, let me talk about his proof, okay? So his proof is on page 329, and what he does is he starts by picking a manifold with or without boundary, and he chooses a covering by, a smooth, by smooth coordinate charts. And then he says, in each, in, each, in each coordinate domain, there is a Ramanian metric that you can get from G alpha. Ah. Yeah, I should write some of this down. I, I guess we don't need this anymore, right? So I could, I can write some, let me, I won't write the whole proof, but I'll write some key ideas. Draw a picture, maybe it'll make more sense. So you've got, you got the manifold. All right, and it's chopped up, possibly overlapping, but I'll just draw them like they're not. Chart domains, right, like U1, U2, et cetera. All right, and those, um, they're, you know, coordinate maps, let's say phi 1, down here to Rn, uh, I guess Rm, right? So, uk, phi k, Rm, okay? So there's some atlas which covers the manifold by assumption, right? And then the thing is, we've got these smooth bijections down to Euclidean space, don't we? And what lives in Euclidean space? <coughs> there is a smooth covariant two tensor, symmetric covariant positive definite, positive definite two tensor that lives down here, namely, um, you know, Oh, he has a notation. I should, this is a notation that's important. Otherwise, later the chapter won't make sense to you. He uses, and I, f I think I've already failed, you guys, because my example one, I was supposed to put, this is G bar, all right? G bar, J bar. Generally speaking, J bar is, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm an idiot. I equals one to N of uh, dx i squared. This is the Euclidean metric on Rn. G bar is the Euclidean metric on Rn. So the point is, you got your Jabar here, and you got a Jabar here, and you got a Jabar here, and I mean, I guess it could be a civilized person call it G bar. But the point is, you've also got this map, right? Coordinate chart. <laughs> that, that goes from here to here, right? And so what did we just get done talking about? We can pull it back. So pull it back under feet, under the coordinate chart. The pullback of G bar, we could call like G1, for instance. Right, and you could pull back in here, on this guy, you could have the, you know, we could have GK, the pullback under the kth coordinate chart of G bar. 
All right? And um, so you have all these, right? And then you need something called a partition of unity, which is something we haven't talked about much in here. I mean, I guess we haven't talked about it, but what is a partition of unity? Do you guys know what that is? I don't think you should. So here's, here's what a partition of unity is. Um, a partition of unity is a couple things together. It is, uh, well, he calls it psi alpha. Let me just explain what that means. So psi, he says psi alpha is smooth partition of unity for M. So essentially what this means is that the sum over, um, let me say sum over alpha of psi alpha of P is equal to one. If I recall correctly, that's what this does. So, <clears throat> these, these functions, they have characteristic domains that it's not the whole of the manifold and they can overlap. But if you've got like two of them overlapping, the one has to be like one half, the other one has to be like half, or one has to be a third and the other has, they have to conspire so that the sum of any, the sum of all the ones that are non-zero at a point have to work out to one. That's why it's called the partition of unity. So if you have this situation, then, and, and you can prove that these exist. It's been proved earlier in the book. It's one of those technical things I skipped over because I'm lazy. And um, I should be more lazy. Let's see here. So the, the point is you can just build G from the sum over um, of these things of, um, Oh, how's he, what's his notation for it? So he says psi alpha g alpha. So basically he's, um, <clears throat> he's further, he's, he's merging, he's adapting the pullback thing to the, to the smooth partition of unity. And that way you're like, basically you're pulling back, you know, the Euclidean metric to these, the partition of unity sets such that when you add them together, that, 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 that's a meaningful way of like weaving these different pullbacks together in some sort of uniform fashion, which he proves has got the necessary properties to be a Ramanian manifold. All right, so, and it's not that, I mean, this proof is only a couple paragraphs long and really if you don't understand it, you just need to like go find where he, prove the existence of the partition of unity and study that there if you want to. This becomes important if we want to define integration on a manifold like super carefully. Uh, the partition of unity is important to that. So, um, okay, so the thing is um, the, um, let's see what time I have. All right, well, I'll try to stop in 10 minutes, okay? But um, I wanted to describe to you guys, the, I wanted to answer Ernesto's question today while we're kind of in the midst of all this. Uh, we're not gonna get through metrics today. Like I'm, I have another class day devoted to it, if I remember right. Um, so, so every smooth manifold admits a Ramanian metric, but it's not unique. All right, so like given an abstract space, there are many different metrics that you could put on it. And they don't, they don't have to, there's like many choices. And um, in fact, like if you look ahead in your homework, I actually ask you to find different metrics for the plane. All right, um, so anyway, let's, let's go on here. So uh, if you have a metric, you can talk about the length or the norm of a tangent vector. So let's, let's do these things. Uh, yeah, we do this. Yep. 
it is interesting how much, in some sense, more difficult it is to show that the uh, that there's a Ramanian metric which exists on any manifold. If you think back, Ernesto, to when we proved that an arbitrary finite dimensional vector space has a norm, that was a lot easier. You know, I just picked the basis, <coughs> excuse me, for the space, and I just basically shoved the Euclidean norm on it with respect to the basis, and we were able to prove that was a norm. <coughs> this isn't so different than that, though. It really is the curved analog of that ham-fisted smashing the Euclidean norm onto the vector space. It's the same idea, really. Um, so definition. Uh, <clears throat> length or norm of V in the tangent space to P at M. If we're in a Ramanian metric, he uses the following notation. Um, oops. <laughs> Uh, he puts the sub g on the this because it is the norm with respect to g, and his notation is also this. We take Langle Wrangle uh, v sub g to the one half power, or if you like another, why have one notation when you can have three? Uh, g p v v uh, to the one half. What he has an aversion to square roots, I guess. I don't know, and you can also define the angle between vw not equal to zero, right? And it's implicitly defined by the cosine of theta being vwg divided by the length, uh, I keep doing that, the length of v and the length of w, right? Now, um, okay, so that, that, this is really, what's going on here is he's defining in case you're wondering, GPVV is that, all right? That's a little, that notation gives me a little bit of heartburn because you got the P on the one side but not on the other, but you know, at some point you omit things, otherwise you go nuts, all right? So I guess it's the inner product. Yeah, it's, it, it is in fact a inner product, yeah. I think it's an inner product. It's symmetric. What does it take to be an inner product? Positivity. It's a symmetric, bilinear, positive definite form. Yes, it's an inner product. Yeah. In fact, that's another way we could have said this, is that a metric is a covariant two tensor which is an inner product on the tangent space at each point. Thank you. To not have said that today would be shameful. So, <laughs> all right, so that's the angle. What does it mean for vectors to be orthogonal? VW and TPM are orthogonal if what? If they're inner product, I mean, see if they're metric of V and W. You want to call it inner product, go ahead. If the inner product of V and W um, is equal to zero. Um, he says, one useful, highly useful tool for the study of Ramanian manifolds is orthonormal frames. If we have a Ramanian manifold with or without boundary, just as in the case of Rn, we say a local frame is an orthonormal frame if the vectors uh, form an orthonormal base. So we, we had orthonormal frames for Rn before, but now we have orthonormal frames on the manifold because we have a way to judge perpendicularity of tangent vectors and the length of tangent vectors. All right. Um, so the examples he gives, like example three, he points out that, you know, um, partial, partial Xi is a global orthonormal frame for Rn I think we had that example before. <laughs> and, and then he also points out the uh, frame E1, E2 on the punctured plane is an orthonormal frame for R2, but it's not a coordinate frame in any coordinates, as we observed in example 9.45. 
Ah, I'd have to, I don't have that. I don't have it on me. It's okay though. All right. Um, uh, and here, corollary 13.8. Let MG be a Ramanian manifold with or without boundary. For each P, there is a smooth orthonormal frame on a neighborhood of P. Okay? However, be careful. It's not the case that that smooth orthonormal frame at P also has to be a coordinate frame. That's a trap. If you can find a smooth orthonormal coordinate frame at a point on the manifold, orthonormal in the sense as judged by the metric, that's a much more special situation. All right? Now he defines pullback metrics, which I don't want to do at the moment. I don't want to talk about, I'm going to talk about pullback metrics next time. I wanted to talk about, where does he finally get to the question you're asking? I know it's in here because I've read this chapter. Where'd it go? How long is it till he actually gets back to talking about what a metric? <laughs> Come on, man. It's killing me. Okay, so finally, on page 337, we come back to your question, Ernesto. <laughs> so, on <laughs> 330, this is where I'll stop today. I'm just going to write, it. I'm going to write the formula and talk about it, okay? Um, so, here's, here's the formula for the Ramanian distance function. The length with respect to the G metric of path gamma is the integral from A to B of the length of gamma prime of t dt. And that's with respect to the g. Now, check this out. If I, if I had written, you know, g as like ds squared, and that was, you know, like dx1 squared, well, if I had written that in the sense of, you know, that's the sum over gij, dxi, dxj, then the length of g of gamma would have looked like the sum over, oh my bad, the integral from a to b of the sum uh, over i and j, well the square root of the sum over i and j of um, gij at the point in question um, and then d gamma i dt d gamma j dt dt. And that's the formula for it. It's the square root of the sums of the metric contracted against the derivatives of the path as calculated in the coordinate system. This is exactly the arc length formula. If you instead of putting, if you put g bar there, right, it becomes the stupid arc length formula. That's the Euclidean distance, but this calculates the distance between points. Um, so if you're on the manifold, you know, and you've got a point P, and you've got a point Q, right? Or maybe you've got a point, um, well, yeah, if you've got a point P and a point Q, then um, you can define the distance from P to Q, all right? And how is that defined? Um, well, he's got some work to do here, but he eventually tells you that the distance from G with respect, with respect to the metric G from P to Q is the infimum inf of LG gamma, right, where gamma maps P to Q. It's a, you know, it's a it's, 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 it's a path from P to Q, right? Mind your P's and Q's. I'm sorry, that's horrible. Um, so then uh, you can prove that calculate, you know, taking the least possible distance of all possible paths, that defines a distance function between points. And you can prove that that distance function has the necessary, def you know, it satisfies the axioms of a metric as you guys have learned in topology this semester, namely that it's, it's positive, symmetric, right? And if it's zero, it must be that P equals to Q. 
and um, triangle inequality also follows through, although that's probably a little bit more technical, but yeah. So in that, so that's why we, so for Ramani manifold, we'll say that that's the distance function. The metric is a more of a local concept, all right? And so the larger story here, as we go on, the interesting question is, when is it the case that the manifolds really just Rn, like locally speaking? So a manifold that look, like locally looks like Rn, we, we call that a flat manifold. And so the, the, the very interesting and difficult question to answer is when is a man, well, it's, okay, there's other, I guess it's not the most different, difficult question to answer, but it's an interesting question to answer, which is like, what does it take for a manifold to be flat? Right, what does that mean? How do we define that, all right? So next time, we'll, we'll look at more examples of metrics. We'll talk about this pullback metric, which is just incredibly useful. Basically, you can take, if you've got like a metric on something that's a curve space and you take that metric and you pull it back to a flat space and otherwise intuitively flat space, it'll make the geometry of the pullback metric a curved geometry. So you can do all kinds of wackadoodle things. Like you can make flat things and flat things curved in that sense. If you give it a, and I say an abnormal geometry, I don't know, what do you want to call it? But um, the ultimate answer to that question, though, is given by the structure of something called the curvature tensor, which is a rank four tensor, which involves, like I think, second derivatives in the metric. It's very complicated. We're not going to do that in this course. So the, the ultimate answer to the question of flatness is given by the curvature tensor, which is a bit much for us. But what we're going to do in the last story arc of this car course is we're going to study surfaces. Surfaces are just two-dimensional manifolds. And there, we can completely take ownership of curvature. It's called Gaussian curvature because Gauss found it, like everything. And, and we'll ultimately see this beautiful theorem called the Gauss-Bonnet theorem, which links topology and geometry. It, it, it's, it links the Euler characteristic of the manifold to the total curvature of the manifold. And um, anyway, that's the hint of, that's like the, the most well-known famous, really interesting nexus between um, topology and geometry that we're still trying to find deeper analogs of that today. Every so often, every generation finds a new one of these and that person gets a field medal, you know, or something like that. I don't, it's, it's ongoing. It's, it's an open question, exactly what the interplay is. Is this curvature related to that last lecture you gave in complex? Yes, very much so. So hopefully that last lecture in complex, we're actually going to get much closer to understanding the formulas there. Although I don't know if I'll cover everything I did there. Hey, hey. Anyway. Um, yeah, go ahead. I thought if you do an analysis of something like the calculus, it is a prerequisite to have some notion of distance. Like within advanced mass calculus, we started by defining the norm and then have norm vector spaces and that's where you construct analysis. Mm -hmm. Why are we doing this at this point of the class instead of, it's the notion of, does that make sense? You're asking why now the distance? Why not at the start? Yeah. Doesn't every manifold have to be a Ramanian manifold? In order to be able to do any form of and, 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 um, So the short answer to that is no. We can still do calculus on non-Ramanian manifolds because there are other notions of distance than just Euclidean distance. And so those manifolds don't have a metric. They might have what's called a semi-Ramanian metric. Semi-Ramanian metric, you drop the uh, positive definite condition, you replace it with a non-degenerate condition. The non-degenerate condition just requires non-degenerate symmetric form. Uh, basically, that makes this space locally look like Minkowski space. Roughly speaking, Minkowski space is the space that's natural to special relativity. You have weird things there, like the analog of norms. You have non-zero vectors whose norm is zero, so-called null vectors. This correspond to light in special relativity. Uh, in fact, semi-Ramanian geometry is the geometry which is needed for Einstein's general relativity. This stuff we're doing is too nice. It's worse than that. Um, but nevertheless, the curvature tensor and those deeper things still can be defined over semi-Ramanian geometries. And there's more than that out there. 
you can, this is an open question as well, like what kind of structure can you define on a manifold that you can meaningfully take something local and study its global ex abstraction and like how does that interplay and like what do you do? Um, there's symplectic manifolds. There's thing, th these manifolds come with something called a contact form, like the last chapter in Lee is about that. Um, and those play an important role in like uh, studying classical mechanics and the phase spaces of classical mechanics. Like, um, you know, we study const constraints, like the Lagrange multiplier constraint problem. So sort of like the grown up version of that. How do you understand constraints and their interplay with like Newton's laws? How do you study that? Um, but up to this up to this point, you're right. Like the concept of manifolds, kind of plain vanilla. The more interesting aspect of it's missing, which is, I mean, to me, the metric is where it starts to really get interesting, because the questions aren't just like up till now. In some sense, what are we doing? We're doing linear algebra, pointwise, and we're just trying to weave those together in a in a smooth sense. That, but that's kind of it, right? It's just more or less linear algebra part three for you guys, right? Um, or part four if you had my advanced calculus. Sorry, Preston. Maybe next year, right? If you're not tired of me. Are you offering that level, of course? <laughs> Hopefully in the spring next year we'll have, we'll have advanced. I am convincing one of my, my calculators. Hey, hey, hey. Oops. <laughs>